Yeah, we are in uncharted territory, and we're moving into the seventh year of the Revelation 12 sign a little later on this month. And I want to talk about some things that we may need to be ready for. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about the uh, comet uh, Nishimura. I'm not going to do a full study, but I do want to bring that to your attention. I have a couple of comments on that as well. But before we get to all of that, uh, I want to begin with a tale of two pastors. Okay, I, I had contact from two pastors, a good one and one that is completely and utterly lost when it comes to eschatology. Let's start with the good one first, okay? Uh, Pastor Rich sent me a couple of verses from Jude, and, and they kind of set me back on my heels a little bit. For reference, before I show you those verses, remember, the Lord has shown us what to look for in his coming, and the greatest teaching in all of prophecy at the Olivet Discourse about his coming, he tells us what to watch for. These are instructions for the church at the end of the church age, i.e. us. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on earth, distress of nations with perplexity. Why? Because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. And then it moves into more of a panic mode. People fainting of fear and foreboding because of the ones, it says literally in the Greek, coming Unto the earth. And other versions, this is the Luke version, in other versions, it just mentions it as stars falling from heaven, which we know is Satan and his angels. That's why at the sixth seal, it says stars fall from heaven are like the winter figs being cast to earth. Winter figs are no good, they don't ripen, they look like figs, they're worthless. All they can do is grow on the tree for a while and plop down on the ground. That's all they're good for. Because war in heaven. That's what we're told in every single version. Why are these signs happening? For the powers of the heavens, the authority, the authorities in the heavens will be shaken. And then, and only then, will we see the Son of Man coming with great power and glory. War in heaven is coming. And the signs we're looking for are right there. And I cannot wait for the day I wake up and later on we start hearing the beginnings of the nations being perplexed because something is happening to the sea and the waves. So let's talk about those verses that Pastor Rich sent me in Jude. Jude says he was going to talk about our common salvation, but something kind of came up and he wanted to talk about the evil that is in the world. All kinds of bad things, things that look good but are evil, and so on and so forth. And he ends that brief discussion with these two verses. Listen to this. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their shame. Right off the bat, what he's saying is this is a reference to what we just looked at. Because those waves that will be perplexing the nations being caused by angels who have fallen and have thrown in with Satan. That's why there's war in heaven. They're the ones causing the wild waves and the foam. And the second part of that is this. Wandering stars, not fixed stars, but stars, angels that wandered away from their first estate, for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Isn't that amazing? Now, Jude is considered the brother, the literal brother of Christ, and he is definitely pointing to the Olivet Discourse, talking about those signs that will proceed immediately, immediately precede the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The sea and the waves roaring because the angels that walked away from their first estate and followed Satan, war has been declared on them, and it's to their shame. That's why it's happening. And their plight, utter darkness forever. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, I, I bet I've seen that a dozen times and just, you know, read right past it, of course. So thank you, Pastor Rich. There's so much more in there, I'm sure, that some really good theologians could, you know, 
flesh out for us. But the really good theologians, unlike Pastor Rich, have turned away from the Olivet Discourse. And that brings us to the other pastor, Pastor Stephen Sewell, who left a comment on one of my videos that I've got the Olivet Discourse all wrong. It's all about Israel. Even though the Lord is talking to the founding fathers of our faith, the, the disciples who he just recently said, I will build my church, and pointing to Peter, and I'm building it upon what you just said, Peter. This is his important, important moment. And he tells us in the Olivet Discourse, this is for everybody. This is for everybody. What I say to you, I say to everybody. And then he backs that up with saying, see, take heed now. See, I've told you all things. In a couple of days, he's going to be in the upper room and he's going to tell them I'm going away, but I will return and I will receive you unto myself. The Olivet Discourse is showing us how that will happen. It's the most important teaching the church could be involved with. But the pastor thinks that I'm the problem, of course. Let me tell you something. I will never be criticized by the Father. Oh, I might get criticism. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, I have forgiveness of the hideous life that I led before I came to the Lord in November of 2007, but I still may very well get criticism, but he will never criticize me for leading people to his son's teaching at the Olivet Discourse. That is not going to happen. Hear him. Listen to the Lord. You will never go wrong banking on the Lord, being all in on what he has to say. So here's what the uh, pastor, uh, you know, closed out his little message to me with. You have no idea the harm you are causing God's people with this teaching. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Pastor Stephen Sewell, I know you don't know this pastor, but you're projecting right there. You're projecting right there. This is the sorry state that we're in. When somebody comes along and says, you know what? We need to listen to the Lord at his teaching about his coming. And that is harming God's people. He thinks that's harming God's people. It's unbelievable. It is absolutely stunning to watch this happen. So if you know a pastor like that, maybe you go to church where there's one like that. And that's why they're asleep. That's why they are completely asleep at the will. What you're going to hear on Sunday is something you could have heard 10 or 15 years ago, like nothing is going on out there. Same old, same old. Let's just teach the same old stuff because they have no idea of the times they live in. If you have a pastor like that or you've had that teaching thrown in your face before, listen carefully to this because you need to be set free from it if you haven't been already. Okay, on top of the... Here's what they do. Here's what they do. They disregard the Olivet Discourse. That's number one. Then number two, they come along and say, see, Paul, Paul is revealing the secret rapture, the mystery rapture to us. Okay, and, and, and so we don't listen to the Olivet Discourse for us. That's for, that's, that's for somebody else. That's for Israel. That's for the second coming. That's not for us. See, Paul told us a mystery. This is what they say, of course. So let's go to that verse, but before we go to that verse, let's go to the verse beforehand. Now, in Corinthians, Paul has spent a number of verses talking to them about a problem. And the problem is this. It's summed up in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. There's a problem. There's a problem. We can't get there with these bodies. And then the next verse is, behold, I show you a mystery. Here's the cure for that. We will not all sleep. And then he goes on to say, the rapture turns us from perishable to imperishable, from mortal to immortal. That's the cure. He's not saying I'm introducing a brand new event. He's taking an event that exists and says, this is the cure for that. This mystery, and it is a mystery. A mystery doesn't mean I'm telling you something for the first time. He already has talked about the rapture a couple of years earlier to the Thessalonians. A couple of years later now, he's talking to the Corinthians about it. He said, this is the cure. 
This is what the Lord talked about at the Olivet Discourse, and it's the cure for that flesh and blood problem. We won't all sleep, but we all will be changed. The rapture will always be a mystery. Christ is called a mystery. Lawlessness is called a mystery because it's all part of the great plan of God that he already had secretly at the very beginning. He's not making this stuff as making this stuff up as he goes along. It was always a part of his plan. Today, I could say, I want to tell you about the mystery of the rapture, because it is. It's part of the mystery of God's plan that is playing out in front of us. And that's why when Paul describes the event, there are angels, just like there are angels when the Lord says, I will send out my angels with a loud trumpet. Paul talks about the loud trumpet because it's the same thing, but they have something else in common, and you need to see this, and you need to be aware of it because they won't tell you this. Trust me on it. They will not tell you this. Listen carefully in case you don't know. If you do know, it's probably because you're self-taught. You saw it yourself and said, wait a second. Wait a second. The Lord is talking about the day of the Lord happening when he descends from heaven and sends his angels out. Just as Joel says about the sun turning to darkness and the moon not giving its light and all that, we begin the coming of the Lord with that exact verbiage. We also see it at the sixth seal. The sixth seal is the companion parallel event to the coming of the Lord, but in the book of Revelation. And again, we see that same kind of verbiage about the sun and the moon. It's the day of the Lord. Now, there will be another day of the Lord, but this is a day of the Lord. This is where the Lord shows up and absolutely, in front of everybody, involves himself in the affairs of man. This is a big, big deal. Paul continually aligned our rapture with the day of the Lord. He did this on a number of occasions. It's the same event. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul is going to talk about the rapture, and he begins it by saying, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. Well, that sounds like he's saying, This is coming from the Lord himself. Well, of course it is. Because Paul is taking this from the Olivet Discourse. This has already been discussed by the Lord. He is saying that, opening up the discussion. But let's continue. That we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command. The Lord says that at the Olivet Discourse. He will descend in the air. Don't look for him here on earth. Look for him where the lightning strikes. Look for him where the eagles and the carrion gather over a dead body. Look up there. And he commands the angels to gather his elect. And there's a huge sound of the trump. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, the chapter ends right there. What did Paul leave out in that brilliant discussion of the rapture? And he, and he gave us some more information about it. What did he leave out? When? Yeah, there's no discussion about when. At this point, the Thessalonians have no idea when this event will take place. He has given a clear representation of what the Lord spoke about at the Olivet Discourse, but he hasn't mentioned when. Oh, the pre-trib pastors. Oh, Pastor Sewell loves this chapter break because what they're going to try and tell you is in the next chapter, Paul changes topics. No, 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 no. That is not what is going on here. Remember, chapter breaks were given to us by the Catholic Church. They didn't exist until the 12th century. I like chapter breaks when they're done correctly, but the Catholic Church did not do them all correctly. There should not be a chapter break here. I know why there is, and I'll hit on that in a second, but I want you to see this letter 
in its original form. There were no chapter breaks. There were no paragraphs. Writing utensils were very rare, and you had to really maximize the use. He just wrote it line after line after line after line. So let's look at the very next line in that letter. The very next line in that letter. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers. Now he's turning to when. Why is when not with the other part? Because as we're going to see, it's the one thing we can't know. He told us what he knows. Now he is turning to what he doesn't know. Of course he didn't leave when out of the discussion. Thessalonians want to know what it will Paul will tell us about when he's going to. And watch what he says. You have no need to have anything written to you. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Could it be because they already have seen it from the Lord about the Olivet Discourse? Of course it is. Listen to what Paul says. You have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. This is the exact same metaphor Christ used about his coming, the thief metaphor and the Olivet Discourse. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake. Paul is pointing directly at the Olivet Discourse, and he is connecting the event to the day of the Lord. He is telling them, you know very well the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, and he will go on to tell them, but it, you're children of light. It won't come upon you unexpectedly because you're going to be watching, and he tells them how to do that. Now, ask yourself this, from a pre-trib perspective, why is he even discussing the day of the Lord, since in the pre-trib perspective, the rapture happens way before the day of the Lord? That's not what Paul is saying. He is saying, we can't know when the rapture takes place, because the day of the Lord comes as a thief. We aren't told when it is, so we have to constantly stay ready. That's the point. That was the point the Lord makes at the Olivet Discourse. This isn't a new teaching. This is a new take on an old teaching. He's giving us some more information and pointing out how important it is to constantly stay ready for this event, wherever we are on the timeline. Always stay ready and watchful. That's the point. There would be no point of him, if the, if the day of the Lord was different than the rapture, there'd be no point in Paul telling them to stay ready for the day of the Lord. It wouldn't even be, it wouldn't even be on the table. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where did we learn about his coming? At the Olivet Discourse. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. What does he do at the Olivet Discourse? I will send my angels to gather the elect, for crying out loud. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. He's telling them, I know somebody told you the day of the Lord and you think that you've missed the rapture or are gathering together. You haven't. Again, he is connecting our rapture, the coming of the Lord, with the day of the Lord, just like Jesus did at the Olivet Discourse, just like it is at the sixth seal. Let me show you one more, and this is one that I, you probably haven't noticed. Take a listen to this. Well, let me do a setup first. This is that section of 1 Corinthians where they have this guy in the church who unbelievably is having some sort of affair with his stepmother, okay? And so Paul gives direction to them on this. Listen to what he says. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved. Okay, let's stop right there. So Paul is saying, throw him out. Throw him out. For his own good and for the good of the church, throw him out. And Paul is either saying, now he hasn't lost his salvation, or he is saying, by throwing him out of the church, he still has a chance to be saved. Which one it is, I'll leave that to theologians. What I want to show you is what he says next. Now, if this guy is going to be saved, 
when would he be saved? He's part of the church age. You throw him out of the church, but he can still be saved. Let's say we think he did come back. I think in 2 Corinthians, it's kind of indicated that he did repent and come back to the church. But anyway, when would this guy be saved? Since he lives in the church age, when would he be saved? Paul tells us next, listen, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That's the day of redemption. He's going in the day of the Lord, whether he's alive or dead, if he's saved. And this is what Paul taught about the rapture. This is what the Lord taught at the Olivet Discourse. The day of redemption, lift up your head because your redemption has arrived, is on the day of the Lord. That's the day he is sending out his angels to gather the church. And Paul is repeating that. Of course he would repeat that and emphasize that to the early church. Don't forget that's what we're, that is our goal. That is what we will always watch for. It's not a new teaching. He didn't come up with something brand new. Hey, hey, everybody, I got something brand new that nobody's ever heard before. That's not what he's saying. That's asinine. It's nonsense. And it's absolute, absolutely destructive to the church to turn them away from the greatest teaching when we need it the most, at the end of this age, after we've already seen the great sign, the Revelation 12 sign, to turn the church away from the teaching at the Olivet Discourse. It's absolutely reprehensible. But you're going to have to fight your way through this. This is the nonsense that's out here. That's why the church is the way it is. They don't know what they're looking for because they turned away. You will only get the signs that are available right before he shows up. We don't know the day or the hour. But when we see the signs immediately prior to his coming, his revealing, we'll be in the hour of his coming. And we'll know what to do. Straighten up. Throw back your head. Look up. That's what he wants. He doesn't want you running with the rest of the world, scared witless. I said witless there. I want to make sure. Like W-I-T-L-E-S-S. It's amazing. It's amazing what the church is doing. And there he is. Oh, you, sir, are harming the church teaching them what the Lord taught us at the Olivet Discourse. Shame on you. That's cringeworthy, Pastor. That is cringeworthy. All right, let's get to this. I am seeing some parallels between the two great events inside the Olivet Discourse, the destruction of the temple at 70 AD and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of the church age. We see a similarity in the fact that he gives both groups of people there in the first century where the destruction of the temple was, of course, relative to them, relevant to them. And he tells them, when you see these various signs, run. You can escape what's about to happen. He tells the church of the age, when you see these signs, look up. Because your escape, your redemption is drawn nigh. He gives both groups some instructions to follow. If their work, we know that the Christians did follow it because uh, early historian and church writer uh, uh, Eusebius mentions that the Christians saw the signs, saw Jerusalem surrounded by uh, armies, saw the abomination of desolation that it was taking place in the temple, and they got out and went to Pella in Greece. But the ones who didn't, if there were, didn't escape. Will that be true with us? Will the ones who don't listen to him not escape? I don't know. I, I hope they all escape, but that's not my call. I don't want them left behind, but that's not my call. I don't know. I can tell you this. It's egregious to not listen to the Lord at this time. It's dangerous. And why do that when it's so simple? Listen to him. The rapture is still imminent when you do because war in heaven is imminent. And war in heaven is imminent because we were given the Revelation 12 sign. The Revelation 12 sign in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation is pointing to war in heaven. War in heaven is mandatory to take place before he descends from heaven. Why is it mandatory? He's receiving his bride. He's not taking the bride back to heaven so that Satan can stand there and accuse us. He could go on for days on me alone in my worthless adult life before I became a Christian in December 2007. He says, no, I don't want, you know, that's not going to happen. He purges heaven and the air of Satan and his angels' influence, throws them to earth, where in the next phase, they'll be purged from earth as well until a brief moment inside the millennial kingdom. 
That's what's going on. That's what's happening. But there are parallels to both events. In reading the complete works of Josephus, which I got 900 pages for 99 cents at Amazon. Tough read. It's, it's not pleasant. It's tough. But I am so glad I went through it. Right before 66 AD, where the rebellion suddenly happened one day, as we, as we move with Josephus through those years that he lived in, he lived in that Israel, the wheels came off of Israel's society and government. It was awful. They started getting the worst possible leaders you could imagine. There was crime everywhere throughout the nation. There was unrest it was just an absolute nasty place to be, and then the rebellion suddenly happened. This is what we see in the world today. The worst leaders I've ever seen in my life collected at one time around the world. A few exceptions here or there, but overall and by and large, it's the worst group of leaders I've ever seen. It's unimaginable how worthless they are. Look at ours. It's unbelievable that we have somebody like that sitting in the White House right now. But it, that kind of guy, or gal, in the case may be, they're sitting in houses of leadership all over the world right now. It's unbelievable. This is one of those things where it's paralleling, paralleling the, the events of Israel. Israel's was a local event. The one that's coming is a global event, and it's affecting the globe with crime and unrest everywhere. No one knows who to trust. I go to alternative sites, and I don't even trust those that I'm getting the news when I, when I go there. But there's something else that may come that may also be a parallel that Josephus points out. That besides the, the great signs that the Lord told the first century Christians to watch for, Josephus tells us there were also a group of supernatural events that started taking place. And so that's why I entitled this, Be Ready for Anything, because I think that could be happening now. It may, it may already be happening, but tremendously unusual events that there are, you know, really no natural explanation for began happening as they moved into 66 AD and beyond. Some began happening before 66 AD and the rebellion began. Will that happen here? It very well could be, and I want to get back to that in a second, but let me give you an example. He spends a section of his writing about these events, and he knows these are crazy sounding, but they happened, and eyewitnesses were there to see them, and in some cases, Josephus. One involved a guy, this has happened a few years before the rebellion even happened, a guy named Jesus, a very common name. Now, of course, his real Hebrew name would have been what? Uh, Yeshua or Yehoshua. But this guy named Jesus suddenly began walking around Jerusalem saying, woe to Jerusalem. And he wouldn't stop day and night. They finally took him and beat him, beat him bad, whipped him bad. And then when the whipping was over, he simply picked up where he left off and began walking around again saying, woe to Jerusalem. And then the rebellion happened, and the Roman army showed up. And he walks around during that time going, woe to Jerusalem. Will not stop, day and night. And then suddenly he did stop, and he said, woe to Jerusalem, and woe to me. Because a rock came over from one of the catapults the Romans had set up and killed him. How do you explain that? There was a light that came over Jerusalem that looked like a sword, and it was completely misinterpreted by many of the priesthood. Oh, this is showing us that we'll have victory. If we rebel against Rome, maybe we should do that. No. It was saying, it was saying just the opposite. Catch this one. Before the daily sacrifice ended, a heifer is being taken to the temple to be sacrificed. On the way, it stops and gives birth to a lamb. People saw this. This is, it's incredible. And there are many other things like that. They all heard this giant voice come out of the temple one day or night. I'm not sure it was day or night. And it sounded like many voices. And it said, let us depart from here. And it was booming. A, a door 
to the temple and one of the gates that took 20 men to close opened on its own one night. Things like this were happening. And it was emphasizing that this is a very, very crucial and important time. Will we get those events as well? They may already be happening, but yeah, I think we could very well get those events. We could very well get those events. And maybe that's kind of forecasted when we see the old men will dream dreams and the young men will see visions, that there is going to be a supernatural element to this. It may very well be going on right now. We just don't hear full reports of it. This is something that watchmen and watchwomen can really keep an eye on. Speaking of watchmen and watchwomen, I appreciate people who are looking for things and signs and indications of the times that we live in. For instance, the comet uh, Nishimura that's going to go through Virgo in a few days, and it comes out on the 22nd, on the last day of the sixth year of the great Revelation 12 sign that involved Virgo. It comes out on that day. Is that saying something? It very well could be. Pastor Rich thinks it could very well be saying something, and it also could be saying something nefarious. We'll have to keep an eye on it. But when these things come up like that, for goodness sakes, to the watchmen and watch women, I love you. I appreciate what you do. But don't just do a knee-jerk reaction and tell people that's the rapture. This is what this is what it so often happens. This is what happened at the Revelation 12 song signed back in 2017. It's the rapture. September 23rd is going to be the rapture, 2017. No, it was never intended to be a sign of the rapture. It was a sign of war in heaven that will absolutely lead to the rapture, but not on that day. We've got to stop that. He's given us the signs. The rapture, flat out, isn't going to happen until the signs he gave us take place. We have to have the sea and the waves roaring and the nations with perplexity. We have to have people fainting with fear as they see what is coming on the earth, the stars of heaven falling to the earth. That's when we're supposed to stand up, lift up our head, and know that our redemption. So when you see these things, don't just give this the knee-jerk snap finger reaction of, that's the rapture. See a comet in Virgo? Rapture. See an asteroid in Virgo? Rapture. Think it through a little more. Bring it, bring it and submit it to the Olivet Discourse and look what the Lord said and see how it may fit in. People are getting tired of rapture fatigue when you're burning them out with this stuff. Honor him first and then add your sign to it that you think is important and make your case. We all want to hear it. It's important that we do that. Honor the Lord at the Olivet Discourse. Know the things and the signs to look for so that you can help your neighbors when these things happen and your family members who right now are scoffers. They may not be scoffers when it happens. And it's going to happen suddenly. It was just one day in Jerusalem in 66 AD. Everything appeared normal. And then suddenly it wasn't. And everything changed. The same thing is going to happen here. Be ready for anything.